All right, hi. <laughs> so um, please bear with me. There's a reason I usually work behind the scenes. Um, I can be an awkward public speaker, so brace yourselves. Um, so uh, this is me. Um, <laughs> I'm not, uh, in spite being the British Society for the History of Mathematics uh, Newman Prize winner, uh, which is now my middle name, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not a mathematician, um, or a computer scientist, or a historian, or a Byronist, uh, or uh, even a scholar, um, or an academic, or any of the other extraordinary uh, range of specialists that um, Ada has brought uh, together. Uh, in this really unique way today. Um, I'm an uh, animator. Um, I do visual effects for the most part. Um, I used to work hand-drawn uh, on paper and film. Uh, now I work in extremely complicated uh, software. Um, and I actually, uh, around 2009, I was looking for uh, a comic to draw um, because I was uh, trying to get away from computers. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, as uh, on this fateful uh, kind of period in 2009, um, Sue Sherman Sue uh, started. Uh, an old friend of mine um, uh, had started Ada Lovelace Day, and uh, we were in a pub, or I should say, uh, strictly speaking, a wine bar. Uh, it sounds a bit more shishi, though, so I usually say it's a pub. Um, uh, and uh, Sue had started a lovely state, and she said, you're a woman in tech, you should do a blog post. Uh, and I said, I don't even know who Ada Lovelace is. Uh, and she said, it doesn't matter. And I said, well, I'll, uh, do, a, I'll do a comic. I've been wanting to do a uh, comic for ages. So I um, ran to Wikipedia, uh, found these crazy kids. <laughs> uh, and literally, uh, in one evening, um, I drew this uh, comic. It's about this long, uh, physically. It's only uh, eight panels. Um, <laughs> this, is <laughs> this is possibly the gag that sealed my fate. Uh, it was just a very, very brief sketched history of uh, Lovelace and Babbage and the writing of the program. Uh, and then uh, when I came to the end of this little micro uh, story, um, I had to have a blank panel because, of course, Lovelace dies and there's no computer and uh, it, it's not really an ending, it just sort of goes wah, wah, wah. Uh, So I used to work in story and I know you're not supposed to do that, so, uh, so I just threw in this panel. <laughs> um, and then this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think uh, I was thinking of the Avengers. <laughs> which actually... <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> um, so, uh, and then I went to bed, uh, put it up online, um, and uh, then uh, the next day it had uh, thousands of hits, and it turned out that it had turned up in Wired, uh, a Wired blog, um, as an announcement that, oh, look, this person is going to do a comic about Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace fighting crime. Um, so I should say there's two enormous uh, misconceptions uh, that were generated by this. Uh, number one, that I had any intention of drawing a comic about Ch Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace fighting crime. This was a punchline uh, joke um, about an imaginary comic uh, and what it would have looked like. Um, and the other thing is that Charles and Ada are not superheroes. They are, in fact, super villains uh, in this comic uh, because, uh, as it happens, I hate computers and they invented this uh, terrible thing, uh, the computer. <laughs> um, I hate it. I should say that in the past tense because uh, uh, this has been a journey for me, this uh, whole comic here. Um, so I started drawing comics. Oh, here we go. Uh, it's just started a WordPress blog. It's very easy. Uh, you can do it on a whim. I uh, started throwing up uh, these little comics where, of course, they fight crime. Uh, they fight crime badly. Uh, <laughs> um, if they fought, fought crime well, it wouldn't be funny. So, um, 
so, um, sorry, I have to look at my notes here because uh, every once in a while a wave of terror will come across me and <laughs> then I have to reconsult. Um, uh, so, um, of course, now that I, I was going beyond the eight panel uh, comic, I had to do a whole bunch of uh, reading to get more gags, uh, obviously. <laughs> Uh, so I just went to um, a bookshop and started leafing through uh, books on Lovelace and Babbage. And of course, what I discovered uh, was uh, that I had been handed uh, by the universe um, both a wonderful gift and a ticking bomb. Um, because, of course, uh, the scholarly line was that Lovelace was this fraud who was just used by uh, Babbage, and of course, she, this makes her absolutely the worst conceivable role model for women in technology. Um, as a woman in technology, sort of, um, actually, that sort of is, is kind of the point here, because I'm very used to uh, being underestimated, uh, but I'm also very used to feeling like a fraud. Um, so. Uh, Drawing this comic became this uh, very strange, fraught uh, space uh, for me. Um, and it was always an undercurrent, uh, I guess, of terror in the comic, but also of uh, curiosity and also of, uh, I don't know, I felt I had been tasked with doing this thing. I had a reputation in my hands uh, of Lovelace, uh, who was very important to a lot of people. Um, and. Uh, I also, and we're all nerds here, I'm guessing, uh, uh, and I also became obsessed. I mean, it's very, very easy to become completely obsessed with these people. Um, they're huge personalities, and they tick a lot of boxes, and they ring a lot of bells, and they push a lot of buttons. So um, I couldn't stop reading about them, and I couldn't stop coming, with gags, uh, coming up with gags about them, and I couldn't stop drawing them. Uh, I was constantly doing little doodles of the characters. So I kept going online. Um, and um, so here I was with this task uh, from the universe. Um, so um, I guess the big question for me was how to approach this. Um, so I'm not, as I said, a scholar of any kind. Um, I'm an animator. Um, and in uh, animation, what we do is we create uh, illusions. Uh, we create illusion of life, of thought, um, an illusion of movement. Um, but to create these illusions, you have to be, um, uh, you have to be very knowledgeable. And you have to do a lot of study and a lot of anatomical breakdowns. Because once something begins to move, uh, all the relationships change. Uh, you start to see the back of things. You see the underside of things. You see all sides. So for the animator, um, it's very important to understand how things are constructed and put together. And I think that's how I came at uh, this project. Um, the first thing the animator does, even if you're doing something quite um, cartoony, is research. Um, and what you, uh, <laughs> I drew some unicorns in, because uh, it looked a bit plain. So, um, <laughs> and also, Google Books is simply wonderful. I think the other, the very serendipitous thing that happened was that I, I started the drawing co the comic, this pretty much identical to Google Books project dumping enormous amounts of 19th century material searchable online. Um, and this gave me actually superpowers. <laughs> um, uh, because actually, um, <coughs> Babbage and Lovelace were incredibly famous people. Um, Babbage especially, I was very surprised because I had been uh, kind of given this story that he was this sad underdog ignored by all. Uh, whereas he was in fact incredibly famous as a super genius who had invented this incredible calculating machine. Um, so there is, uh, Babbage stuff is absolutely everywhere. There's, there's tons of fantastic Babbage stuff. Uh, and he's very frequently paired with Lovelace in these kind of little anecdotes. So he shows how this is, a, this is very typical. This is the great calculator. I think this is the Deseret News. Um, it's a reprint of a famous set of anecdotes that got reprinted all over the place. Um, just Babbage talking about, you know, his stuff. Uh, it's just an example. I think this one's in the book. Um, so, um, the form that the comic began to take was I would, um, because I, I was in this strange pace that I was reading a lot of 19th century sources that no one had read before, 
Um, I was also reading, I'd, I think I'd read every secondary source uh, inside out. Um, and I began to feel this disconnect um, between this story that some people are telling and the story that I was seeing in the um, uh, kind of more um, contemporary uh, view of them. Um, and I, I, so I, I started doing this split. Uh, the comic is very much about uh, these two cultures. I, I love the whole C.P. Snow two cultures thing, um, even though it's a bit silly that, um, you know, you have the, the world of the humanities and poetry and, and uh, you know, craziness, and then you have the world of facts. And um, so the comic is uh, split, very literally split, between the comic, which takes place in the top half, and the notes, which happen in the bottom half. Uh, and certainly on the blog, um, I avoided, as far as humanly possible, any sort of interpretation whatsoever. Um, this was the fact part, so it was, generally speaking, links to interesting primary documents, of which there are tons. I mean, the, the really nice thing is that Babbage uh, docs in particular are incredibly entertaining uh, nine times out of 10 because he was a very funny guy. Um, so um, there was always something fun to link to. Uh, and so I was, I was having this very extreme split between the story uh, and the fact. Um, I have to reconsult my notes here. Where am I? Ah, all right. Yeah, said that said that too, uh, said all this stuff, yeah, all right, um, yeah, so um, in, in a sense it was also um, a very passive, uh, a lot of the comic, I confess, is, was a sort of a passive aggressive joke about the secondary scholarship in that I was doing these very broad, crazy comics, creating these invented stories, uh, and it was a little bit of a commentary, I think, on um, how I think a lot of, um, I'm, I think biographers could stand to bear in mind that they are also creating a character and creating a story, very much the way you create a fictional character. Um, so, um, the, uh, because I was doing a comic, um, I wasn't under any requirement at all to be realistic in any sense. Um, I come from theater, actually, uh, originally before animation. Um, I studied Commedia dell'arte, so there's a lot of that. Um, in the comic, this feeling of character types. So in the comic half, I'm trying to tell this um, almost, uh, it's a satire, of course, uh, about um, tech and its impact on the world and how people think technologically and about data. Uh, the first comic was a joke, uh, uh, was a very extended joke about the economic crisis where Babbage builds this economic model that rampages around. Um, so it, it's satire with broad characters, but um, I was also, I, I wasn't quite sure what to talk about in this uh, tar. I thought this might be fun. I used a lot of tarot cards. Um, again, it's a bit of a two cultures thing because I was looking for um, this dreamlike, fantastical side to this story. What, what people feel about these characters, what people think about these characters, what associations people have with them. Um, you know, as opposed to this kind of jumble of facts that you have. So um, I found tarot really extraordinary because um, the first two cards of the tarot deck after the fool are the magician and the high priestess. And the magician uh, deals with physicalities, objects, the manipulation of the physical world. And the high priestess is about, you know, uh, secret, uh, conceptual, um, hidden knowledge, relationships, um, religious ideas. And um, Lovelace actually specifically calls herself Babbage's high priestess, um, referring, I'm pretty sure, to the oracle of Delphi. She was picturing the machine as this oracle, and she would be the high priestess of it. Uh, and Babbage, of course, and it, it's, it's very much about this division of hardware and software. And, and um, so I played a lot with these kind of divisions of types and all these sort of storytelling things. Yeah, I thought that might be interesting. Um, but I had to keep coming back to, uh, again, in animation, we deal very much with, um, we always have to come back to the real and keep it nailed down, otherwise you can't do the illusion. Um, this is just an example of a sort of study that I do, um, hand studies for Lovelace's type hand, Babbage's type hand. It's dealing with these dualities, these contrasts between these, um, these types of figures, types of anatomy. Um, Oh, might be interesting. Um, and again, you know, dealing, thinking about, uh, <laughs> I, 
I love that. This is my very favorite. It's so tiny, but it's just my favorite Babbage um, snippet. Um, uh, and I guess I started to think about uh, the anatomy um, of, the, um, of the comic as being related to the notes uh, and to the, the primary documents in specific. Um, so I kept coming back to the primary documents and feeding stuff out of that and going back in and going back and forth between kind of these stories and associations and, and these facts. And um, uh, so from this, this is another, I, yeah, just thinking people might be interested in process here. Um, so these are some sketches of Babbage's sort of body language that I drew um, to get a sense. It's that committed alarte thing because it's, it's um, I, I love that sort of very broad style of body language. And I was thinking of him as this very linear person. And it's, this is very much drawn from his own writings. I mean, Babbage wrote a tremendous amount. The, the, you, you, I think if you stacked up all his books, they'd be about, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If you include the pamphlets, it's like this. Um, and then there's tons of anecdotes. He was a very, very popular person for people to tell anecdotes about. The thing about Babbage is that he's easy. I fell in love with Babbage first. I, I, I'm not going to lie. Uh, he's still kind of my favorite. Um, uh, and his personality is extremely evident in every single thing he wrote, and it's very consistent. And it's, you know, it's kind of perfect for my little schematic because um, he's this very solid, grounded guy. He's very direct. His body's always a kind of straight line. He's a bit centered kind of in the middle of his body. He's a very confident guy. Um, and his, his body language is, uh, uh, you know, in my head, comes out of his writing. You can feel the way that he's standing. Um, and I was absolutely delighted when I fell across this. <laughs> uh, I am 95% sure this is Babbage. It's not actually labeled as Babbage. This is 1851 from... Uh, the punch great exhibition gag issue. Um, and there's, uh, there's gags about all the types that you're seeing around the great exhibition. Uh, and this is the fancy portrait of the gentleman who has been honorably mentioned by Prince Albert, honorably mentioned indeed, is that all scandalous? Uh, and Babbage, of course, was furious that they didn't have the um, difference engine fragment in the, uh, um, in the exhibition. He wrote a pamphlet uh, about him, and <laughs> it was about it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, I guess I, I, was, I was really pleased that I, I you know, maybe sort of captured something about the guy. Um, but then you come to Lovelace, and of course Lovelace is a problem, because Lovelace is always a problem. Um, this is some sketches that I was kind of coming at. Um, because I had Babbage and Babbage was so clear, I started building Lovelace in opposition to Babbage. So Babbage is very linear, he's very direct, uh, and he's in the middle of his body, whereas Lovelace, uh, I'm always looking for spirals and indirect lines. He's always looking kind of off to the side uh, or around. Um, and this is something that really comes out in her letters, I think, um, in that, uh, She's this incredibly protean person. Anyone who's, who's read her letters will find that she's changing personalities like drastically from, <laughs> you know, one day to the next almost. She's, she's got a completely different personality, almost unrecognizable sometimes. Um, always quite forceful and always, there's something always a bit ferocious about her. Um, but sometimes she's a bit the coquette and sometimes she's joking around and then sometimes this, she's this complete weirdo and sometimes she's this and sometimes she's that. So. Uh, she's trying on, and I feel she's very difficult to know, if not impossible to know, as a human being because she's always trying all the, on all these personas. Um, I guess, you know, just speculating here, but I, I think at the end of the day, her base actual personality was simply not possible to have as a Victorian woman, and certainly not as a Victorian aristocrat. You can't be that sort of person and be in that position. Um, she's always, I, part of this, Thing in her letters is she's, I feel she's always pretending to be who the person that she's writing to wants her to be. Um, and she's quite, and she always over, overplays it uh, a little bit. So um, Ada, Ada and the comic kind of wound up being um, what I felt she wanted to be uh, a bit. Um, I, I kind of wanted to set her free because she's obviously a person who's in so much pain um, and, and so not comfortable uh, uh, with kind of her lot in life. So I, 
I wanted her to have this wonderful um, engine to uh, play around in and, um, and all this stuff. So um, uh, the Lovelace I wound up kind of choosing uh, to use is actually very much the one in relation to Babbage. Um, not only because they're, they're a dynamic duo, so you know, they have to have dynamic duo stuff, um, but also because for me, my favorite Ada uh, of all the myriad Adas um, is the one in her correspondence with Babbage over the writing of the notes, where she's, uh, she's so confident and funny, and you know, she's joking around, and she's you know, on task. Um, and I, I just really love this Ada, and she herself um, wrote about the notes that uh, she's, you know, in her own note, she says she's, it's got this masculine quality, feminine quality, this androgynous sort of um, uh, style of writing that she had discovered for herself in her persona as the person writing the notes, which is a, a really remarkable persona uh, with this. Um, actually, I have to say from the lecture this morning, I was so thrilled to get a confirmation that she had read Peacock's algebra because I was casting around for where she picked up this bizarre style that she does the notes in for someone who'd been taught by De Morgan and Babbage, both of whom are extremely lucid, you know, un, you know, very clear and straightforward writers. And then it, for her, you know, mathematics paper, she's writing in this convoluted, you know, sentence that's this long and all that. And then as in part of my research is uh, I read Peacock's algebra and I was like, Peacock, <laughs> it's, that, it's that, this is how, I, and you could see her thinking, this is how a mathematician would write, you know, with these long sentences and the detached we uh, that she uses and, and all this stuff. So there's a bit of Peacock maybe <laughs> uh, in this Ada. Um, so it's the Ada uh, with Babbage that I sort of wound up using because I felt that with Babbage, and again, this, this is my speculation because we can't know, you know, it's the, everyone's dead and, and long dead. Um, for me, it always felt like Ada f felt she could really be herself with Babbage and vice versa, um, that that was her most authentic self. Um, uh, I love this thing that I found. Um, this isn't in the book, actually, because I was saving it up for something else. But um, this is Lady Eastlake, who's this so slightly catty uh, <laughs> lady. But I, I love this line. Uh, she, he was amused at my saying that Babbage and not Byron should have been her father. Um, she doesn't know that they know each other at this stage. I was amused uh, a couple of days later, she says, I was amused after my remark to find that Babbage uh, and herself, the greatest friends, uh, I think this is 45. Um, uh, so um, this idea of her and Babbage as these, uh, uh, as these people who could, uh, who, it was them against the world a little bit, uh, was a sense that I started getting from uh, from their letters, from the documents, just I guess it's a sense that you get, you know, you, uh, I mean, I can't tell if it's an objective sense or not, probably not, but it's a sense that I got. Um, this is another, um, one of the things about um, Lovelace is that whereas Babbage is always on character, like I have never ever, despite, you know, reading hundreds of kind of things about Babbage, he has never gone, he has never stepped out of character. He's always like, oh, Babbage, or, oh, Babbage, what are you doing? Like, he's always very uh, exactly as he should be. Whereas Ada, every single thing I've ever found of, about her, I'm like, oh, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know that side of her at all. Uh, everything is surprising. Everything is different. Um, so here she's pitching into the Turkish ambassador about the rights of women, which is not what I pictured her doing at all. <laughs> Um, so that's, yeah, it's a little surprise there. Um, now I've lost my thread again, I'm going back to my notes. Talk amongst yourselves. Uh, said that. Ah, all right. Um, oh, uh, actually, um, Richard Holmes, uh, has, uh, told you to expect me to explain why Lovely smokes a pipe. Uh, oh, wait, 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 I have to jump ahead here. Uh, this is pocket universe Ada versus um, the actual Ada. Um, lovely smokes a pipe. I, to begin with, it, because I was filling in a compositional gap in a drawing, this little white space that I didn't like, and so I stuck a pipe in. Um, it's a reference to Sherlock Holmes, obviously, um, but it's also that I thought, uh, to be blunt, that people would take her more seriously if she was smoking a pipe. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've always thought that sometimes, you know, famous philosophers are talking complete bullshit, but people take them seriously because they've got the pipe. Uh, 
that's obviously the missing uh, accoutrement. Um, so this is uh, just a little demonstration here of, of uh, kind of the process again. Um, so this again is by Ada completely surprising you. Uh, this is the New York Mirror, 1833. This is actually the same year that uh, Lovelace met Babbage. Uh, oh, fi, it is said that Ada Byron, sole daughter of the noble bard, is the most coarse and vulgar woman in England. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I, I believe this might be a reference to A, the fact that Ada was very weird. Um, pretty much everyone remarks on the fact that she's quite odd socially. Um, but it also uh, might be alluding to the fact that she tended to swear. Um, she swore a lot in her letters. Uh, and then I kind of combined that with um, Babbage's wonderful error pop-up, um, which I, this is for some reason in the exhibition to 1851 pamphlet. Uh, he describes uh, his error pop-up. So if you have the wrong thing in the engine, this little plaque will pop up that says wrong. Uh, and then he adds later the continually ringing loud bell, uh, which I'm sure would be absolutely delightful if you were programming this machine. So, um, uh, so I did this. Uh, <laughs> this is drawn from life. <laughs> and then it's you have to have the punchline to the punchline. <laughs> For a special <laughs> angle. Uh, that's a good time. Uh, so yeah, I mean, Pocket Universe Ada is a specific facet of Ada um, because it's too hard to draw all the various Adas. Um, and this image that I did for the 200th, um, I just wound up kind of turning her face uh, from camera because I think there's something very ultimately unknowable about her as a person. Um, oh, this is just, it's another uh, kind of thing that I, uh, came, just in, 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 the, in terms of kind of playing between um, uh, how I kind of played with stuff, I guess. Um, Lovelace, of course, famously, as I think every single person has mentioned, uh, had uh, an addictive personality, uh, gambling, opium, men, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, in the comic, that appears as her addiction to poetry. Um, I've, uh, <laughs> I've sort of, um, of course, the actual Lovelace very much had reconciled these two halves of herself. Um, uh, you know, the, the poetical science bit. But um, if, if that was reconciled in the comic, then you wouldn't have any character movement. So um, she's still very much um, against poetry, and it's this kind of dark side to her. Um, this is from Orga uh, Organist, uh, which is a later story, not in the book, but uh, she's getting kicked out of a poetry club here because she's had a little too much. <laughs> um, so that's uh, Lisa Babbage. Um, I, I guess for me, like it, 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 there's a lot of serendipities that keep happening in the comic. And um, although initially I was very annoyed at Ada for failing to stay in character for even two letters in a row, um, <laughs> at the end of the day, actually, her very protean quality, her very ambiguity, her slipperiness uh, wound up making her the perfect representative of this chaotic, uh, illogical, <laughs> ambiguous side, uh, you know, in a comic that's very much about the two cultures, you know, you've got fact and, and, um, uh, and then you've got this other world. It's not fiction so much as sort of stuff that cannot be pinned down. And I think um, there's been a lot of trying to pin down this very ambiguous thing. And I think it's a very engineer sort of thing to want to do to say, oh, she was this or she was that. She fall. It's like Babbage's, you know, who was the most left-brained, unambiguous <coughs> person, uh, you know, possibly ever, uh, with his little buffers to make sure that nothing, you know, no gear could ever be perfectly out of alignment. Um, an intolerance of ambiguity is, is not going to sit well with anybody <laughs> who needs to stay, hang with Ada for a while, because you, you have to be able to tolerate uh, this ambiguous side of her, but I think that's healthy. Uh, you know, sometimes you just can't know stuff. Um, that said, uh, I just want to bring up this, uh, this paper, um, because I, I, um, 
sometimes you find a document, and um, you scholars here must know this feeling all the time, and it must be fantastic. Um, sometimes you find something that is just really magical. Um, this is from the Southern Review, uh, which is a, um, a very short-lived paper to celebrate the culture of the South, published in Maryland uh, in the wake of the Civil War. Uh, it's kind of an odd little journal. It only lasted a couple of years. Uh, but one of the things they printed in it was letters home from this guy. Um, and um, uh, on his way uh, kind of around London, um, this, uh, oh, God, I'm blanking out on his name. Isn't that terrible? It's in the book. Peel Pike starts with a P. Very short name starts with a P. Um, so he met Charles Babbage because he was uh, sort of connected with uh, scientific types. Um, and there's this incredibly vivid description of Babbage, uh, the most vivid description of Babbage um, uh, as this nervous-mannered guy. And uh, this is 54, so this is um, two years after Lovelace had died. Um, and uh, I just love this line, her peculiar capability, higher, he said, than that of anyone he knew, to prepare, I believe it was, there's that ambiguity, Again, uh, the descriptions connected with this calculating machine, I fear I'm not expressing myself rightly here as to the precise nature of the subject he mentioned. Uh, and then you get this beautiful, um, this beautiful little very human moment. It was the recollection of her miserable life. He spoke of it as a tragedy uh, that seemed to sadden him for the while, uh, speaking in a lower tone of voice and in a manner so subdued that as I stood listening to him, I could scarce believe he was the same nervous-mannered gentleman who had entered the room uh, an hour before. There was so much feeling in both his words and manner that I did not feel at liberty to question him as to the precise nature of the unhappiness of the life he was speaking of. Um, and this, um, uh, this moment uh, for me was a very, very beautiful moment because uh, I had not been able to articulate why I felt that Babbage and Lovelace's friendship was not only genuine but quite a profound one. Um, and this was very much um, not an opinion held by most of the serious scholars um, for whom obviously Lovelace was a tool that Babbage was cynically using, which uh, to me, I guess, for ultimately that, that just felt almost impossible to picture Babbage <laughs> putting up with someone he thought he was a fool for like even more than five minutes. Um, so um, this was a very beautiful thing to find and it was such an obscure journal that I don't know if anybody would have found it without Google Books, um, uh, and at least understood, I guess, what it meant. So, um, and uh, there's also uh, there's uh, some nice little character moments here. This delightful bit. Um, speaking of Lady Lovelace's matter-of-fact mind, Mr. Babbage told me he used to t have a good deal of good-natured fun by telling her all sorts of extraordinary stories, and I'm just <coughs> dying to know what sort of. <laughs> What well, sort of strange little jokes they had going on? Um, because they have this very chummy, elusive kind of way of writing letters that um, uh, you know you, one does long to listen in uh, in a conversation. You also see Babbage gossiping like crazy, uh, a good deal of the Byron Devil in her uncongenial match with Lord Lovelace, and oh my God, Babbage, stop it! Uh, <laughs> so I, in this, you know, you get everything. You get a little bit of the calculating machine. You get uh, you know, this very emotional thing, and you get these little, uh, these little wonderful character moments. So, so hooray for primary documents. Um, and that's uh, kind of the image I drew. Um. Uh, so, um, that's the comic. There's a third character in this comic, uh, central character in the comic, to whom my feelings uh, are always ambivalent. <laughs> and that's the analytical engine. Uh, as I said, um, so Doran Swade, uh, bless him, has, has assured uh, you guys that you'll understand the analytical engine by the time I explain it, uh, which uh, can't swear to uh, that happening. But uh, um, so after all of this going back and forth, fact and fiction, blah, 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 here I had something, an engine that was completely uh, indescribable, apparently, because um, no matter where I turned, everyone would say, um, oh, it's very, very brilliant, but you can't understand it. It's too complicated to explain. Um, and uh, for someone drawing a comic with this thing in it, uh, I felt that I needed to have the engine in there, uh, the actual engine, to contrast it with uh, the comic book engine, which looks like this. Uh, so the engine, this is George Eliot uh, 
her, getting her spell checking uh, done. <laughs> um, so the engine in the comic is this vast labyrinth, uh, you know, which is how I feel about computers. Um, so uh, in contrast, of course, I need to have the real engine. And um, so I, I just wanted a drawing of the thing that I could rip off. Um, but sadly, uh, I was completely shocked and horrified to discover that there did not exist a visualization of the entire engine. So I had to do one myself. Um, based off of this, uh, the papers of the late Alan Bromley, which um, anyone who does anything analytical engine uh, is a helpless slave to. Um, and uh, this was really hard, and I have no idea if it's right, uh, but um, that's my elevation. Um, ish. There's a lot of question marks, as anyone will tell you here. Um, that's about how big it was, I think. Um, it's got three types of punch cards. Now, the easiest way to explain, I, I, this is, um, go on, there you go. So that's how I did the elevation. Um, but before you do that, and here's the person, um, <laughs> before you do that, like, I, I kind of had, you know, set, off, set aside a, a couple of weeks to do this. And as it turns out, it took me, I spent about five months on the engine uh, alone because to do the elevation, you have to know where everything is. And to know where everything is, you have to go through all the papers. And uh, oh my god, it took forever. Um, so um, in the book, I explain it like this. <laughs> um, as Babbage himself found, and God I feel for him, to explain how something is moving in relationships on a static image is really hard. And I don't understand his mathematical notation, and neither does anybody else. So I couldn't just use that. Um, so I did this, and I don't think it's as clear as it could be, Han. So um, I'm going to show you uh, the best way. Uh, here's some bits I built while I get this thing together. So this is the sort of thing I would do, right? Just take a plan, pull it apart, uh, try to figure out what everything did, because uh, you can't actually um, uh, make it do things without knowing like, how everything comes around. Um, this is the, how the cards work, uh, roughly. Uh, I think this is actually a Herschel design? I'm not sure. Uh, Babbage's son um, did some stuff. Um, but the punch cards work on the basic principle uh, that there's levers that are activated. Uh, this is a, a bit inverse in that the lever is activated if there's a hole. Um, these are the lovely barrels, which I'll explain uh, in a sec. They're, they're pretty marvelous. Um, I think that's all I got. Yeah. Um, but the easiest way to kind of explain how the whole thing is put together, which was kind of my missing piece. Um, so this is sort of a baby engine. Uh, it's not the whole thing. Um, this, by the way, is why I hate computers. This is a software I have to work with. <laughs> Uh, in my uh, actual job, these are all your controls. These are more of your controls. Each of these opens up even more controls. <laughs> God knows what most of them do. I've got all these. <laughs> I'm just an animator, man. I, I, but uh, you wind up having to work your way around this. Um, how much time do I got? Oh, no, I'm out of time. But, uh, OK, super quick. Um, this is my artist's impression of the flow, just really roughly, uh, of how this goes. I'm painfully aware that there's all sorts of experts in here um, who are sniggering and going, what the hell? Um, <laughs> uh, so um, as I understand it, you've got these three cards, right? So there's the number cards, which have the number. These are 50-digit numbers uh, in Babbage's kind of most ambitious plan. Each of those columns in that big engine is just one number. Um, the whole height of the engine is just all those digits. Um, if you're only dealing with a three-digit number, the engine's like this high. All the height is just the, the size of the number. Um, so this is just a one-digit uh, kind of slice. And all the slices just go up. Um, so uh, the number card, which I've just stuck where he put it uh, on the plan. Um, so you have these cards with. Um, Exactly Jack Arlene style, if you've seen how one of those things works. Um, it's just a pasteboard uh, card. And if there is uh, a hole, uh, the levers go right through and nothing happens. So that's most of the time. Um, but you leave un one hole unpunched, and that pushes a little lever. Uh, and mostly what Babbage seemed to have those levers do is engage uh, something to the cams, this power that was continually turning under the engine. So then they'd start to move once they were engaged. 
Um, so once you've got, uh, so this is a 50 digit number written on a punch card there. Um, so you have 50 rows of 10 columns each. Each of we, these would in theory have one unpunched hole. And that reads off into the store. Uh, I don't know how. <laughs> Can you help? <laughs> All right, no, no, <laughs> nobody knows how. Um, somehow uh, this takes the card. I mean, it's, uh, you could figure it. I'm sure we could come. Yeah, every one of us could come up with some nifty design that would do that. Um, so that uh, sets off all these levers, and on the levers hook up. Uh, actually, you'd have, probably have the variable card. Um, is, the, is the address? Now I can ask you guys. The address, if you're just reading the number cards into the store, the address would have to come off the variable card, or is that only for mill? OK. So um, before we do that, uh, you have to have the addressing cards, the variable cards, what do you call it? Uh, I call them address cards just because it's, to me, it's more, OK, that's the address of where in the store uh, you're picking it up. And so you'd have, like, apparently some really cool way of kind of designating all these things. Um, and this is a problem, apparently, how these variable cards are going to all deal with stuff. But um, uh, this just hooks up, the variable card just hooks up a number in the store by lifting a little uh, widget um, between this, these racks and the number cards. You, you read out an address, read out a number, uh, so the address hooks it up, and then the number just reads off uh, onto, the, um, uh, onto the storage. So now you've got two numbers just read off the card into the store. And then these guys are the operations cards. So this is the main event here. Um, it could add, subtract, multiply, divide. So they're these little, uh, they're the smallest cards um, with only a very limited number of options on them. Uh, and what these cards do is so unbelievably clever that um, I still can't get over it. Um, how do you do this very complicated thing of adding two numbers together with a single card? They actually, the card runs uh, this little mini uh, widget, uh, which is the barrel. So the card will turn the barrel to a specific location to say, okay, we're going to add now. The barrel turns around and then the barrels go through a little wedge. They, they, they all, act, at least on the plan uh, 25, there's barrels all over the place um, controlling all these things. So um, the barrels will then, from a single instruction on the operation card, uh, run for it a little bit here, the barrels will run through like a little wedge of instructions. And these are bar they're tall barrels with all these zillions of pegs. So one line of pegs on a barrel will activate a couple of dozen levers. And it took like 50 or something to run these operations. Um, and then you just run through you know, a dozen or however many turns of operations you need uh, to get through it. Um, so the basic flow is number cards read off the numbers into the store with the variable cards uh, telling them where. Uh, then the um, operations card says, OK, let's add these guys. So the variable cards will select a uh, number. We'll say, pick up the num whatever number is over here. And it just hooks up. Like the whole machine just works by hooking and unhooking stuff. So it just hooks up with a little pinion, reads it off to this section. So these, the different functions are a different section of very specific machinery for each specific function. So it sends it over here. Uh, and then uh, picks up the second number, sends that over there. Uh, and then these guys go to work and they do their little jazz. Um, <laughs> I've got a, I've got a um, anticipating carry build. Um, I can show you outside if you want to see something more. I'm sure there's, there's a bunch of them around. Um, so it, does, it runs its jazz. And once it's done, then the variable card says, OK, read out the output. Uh, so sorry, first it reads out it out, its output to the little output right there. So it just hooks up, reads it out. Variable card says, OK, read the result out to location whatever. And then it just reads that out, and it's done. So that's the whole operation. So, so that was a little slightly more confusing than I usually manage to do this. I'm on the spot here. Um, this does animate. Uh, this isn't an emulator, by the way. This is hand keyed, because uh, I'm just a monkey. You can run through its little thing. At some point, something would jam, and then the bells would go off, and then 
You'd have to get the urchin with the tiny hands to crawl into it, because uh, <laughs> I don't know how he planned to fix anything that jammed in this thing, because it's basically like a solid mass of metal. Um, I'm sure he had a plan. Um, and I, actually, I just have one final point, which is there's a, there was some concern which um, was just at the limit of my um, technical understanding of the engine. Uh, uh, the, there was some concern over how the um, variable cards and the operations cards and the number cards were all coordinated, because the problem is these are completely disconnected to each other. They're on their own. So you better hope to God that you've got the right set of cards coming through at the same time. Um, so I designed uh, for Ada uh, in this universe of hers. She's got a uh, her programming organ. <laughs> it's got little shortcuts and things, so uh, she can just type in all the functions, and it's all. This is actually based off of. Uh, if you go up to um, Macclesfield, there's this beautiful museum of Jacquard looms, and they have all these wonderful gadgets for punching the cards. Uh, they're pretty magnificent. So, had there actually been an uh, engine, uh, then somebody would have, uh, I'm sure, built this thing. Um, so, on a final note, so I'm run way over, and everyone's starving. Um, on a final note, I have to say. Um, Again, with this did she, didn't she, was she clever enough uh, with Ada, I'm not clever enough to do this. Um, but if you love something and if it's meant to happen, you will make it happen. I, I think, um, you know, for me to kind of specify that she had to have all these specific qualifications and be amazing at, you know, this thing and then she would just step in. Um, you know, I think that's a bit backwards. I mean, Lovelace loved the engine. Uh, that's very clear, I think, in everything that she wrote. Um, and in order to kind of serve her function with the engine, she did, uh, you know, extraordinary things. So um, that's my talk. Thank you. <laughs>